this day to acknowledge that great is thy faithfulness. We recognize your faithful provision and care to us, not only in our own lives, but your faithfulness to your people through the ages. We praise you and we thank you for your covenant love that has not abandoned us to the guilt and consequence of our own sin, but has come to redeem us in all that you have done in sending the Lord Jesus Christ. That he lived a righteous life. That he died an atoning death to pay the penalty for our sins. That he was raised to secure our justification. Our legally, being legally declared righteous in your sight through faith in him. And that he is ascended now to the right hand of the majesty on high and rules us by his word and spirit. And that we have been made partakers of this great salvation and that he's imparted to us the Holy Spirit and the many gifts of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to work in us, to lead us into righteousness in our lives. And we would pray that you do that, that you would use our time today to mold us, that you would be at work always in us to shape us after the image of Christ. For your own glory. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you would be among us this morning and make our, our worship fitting and appropriate to the glory of our great Savior. For we come and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the back of the hymnal, page 871, you'll see um, two questions there. Um, I had that separate section of catechesis. Uh, Instruction, but it's also appropriate to read these and, stay, and um, use them as our profession of faith. The two questions here relate to what they call the states of Christ in the United States. His humiliation and his exaltation. Last week we talked about his, the offices of prophet, priest, and king. He fulfills all of those and is, um, is the fulfillment of those great positions. But he does so, does all of them in humiliation and what is that? So that's what we're answering today in professing. Let's confess our faith together. I'll read the questions. We'll together read the answers. Wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time, wherein consists Christ's exaltation. Christ's exaltation consisted in his rising again from the dead on the third day, and ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Amen. You may be seated. It is, uh, he fulfilled all of the responsibilities and roles of prophet, priest, and king in both of those ways, both in his humiliation, his leaving the glory of heaven to come to earth, and then in his exaltation, his, um, his being um, not only acknowledged, but his accomplishing the glory of the resurrection and the ascension and his rule over us. <coughs> We believe, um, and, and here in a few weeks we're going to highlight that we believe in a living and a risen and a glorified Lord, not an ancient, dead, you know, teacher. He was a teacher, but he was more than that. And uh, the reason we're here is because he is risen and he is glorified. Our reading today from Philippians 3, as I mentioned, uh, doing some of these readings from Paul's epistles, the second part, so the admonishments, and really these are areas in which um, we're, we're taught about fulfilling, um, uh, fulfilling certain things in the law, um, and uh, today um, I think this is a good appropriate counterpart to what we're going to be looking at in 
the sermon. The Philippians 3, 1 through 11. You'll see the, the division here, the life ran in bold, and we'll read it responsibly here. So give attention. Um, this is the word of the Lord. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection. The Lord has blessing to the reading and the understanding of this portion of the word. I think a couple of things to draw from this is, is even though we're preaching and teaching the law, remember the law is, was never an instrument of, uh, of, of actually justifying us. If so, Christ would not have had to come to die. Uh, God would have just used that instrument of the law. Um, also recognize that all of these outward um, of the outward conformity, which was exemplified in Paul's life in his pharisaical zeal, really wasn't enough. Now he realizes that in order to truly fulfill the law of God, it must be the cause of Christ. Christ in us, Christ equipping and enabling us, and, um, and that, um, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection, that resurrection power that regenerates and changes us so that we may live unto righteousness and conform to the law. All the God's glory. So, um, it is a, some very powerful and important words to consider there for you. Hymn 468, let's uh, turn there as we consider. My faith is found in rest in place. Um, you may remain seated as we're singing. We can contemplate these blessings of, of resting in Christ, really. Um, that's our words going through this uh, inquirer's membership. The, the, the words of the catechism, do you and, and, and our membership vows, do you receive and rest on Christ alone as he's offered in the gospel? Do you receive him by faith? And do you rest? Do you accept that he's accomplished everything and accept what he's done for you? That's really it. And to to uh, to rest in him is a beautiful blessing of the gospel. Let's sing <coughs> my faith is found a rest in Christ. <laughs>
continue with learning of the shepherd song this morning. If uh, the young ones and the young at heart leader wants to come on up. Yeah, there's a, there's a few. Oh, we have two for you, bro. Oh, yeah. Up here? Yeah, he might... He, might, he embarrasses you. Like, hey, would you? Now, don't you love to sing these little girls up here? Absolutely. Thank you. Last week, we talked about the 23rd song. And we talked about a way we can remember it. We said, the Lord is whose shepherd? My shepherd. Okay? Let's do it, both of us. The Lord is my shepherd. Okay, good. Now I want to do something else with you. Have you seen people do sign language? All right, let me teach you one or two words you may know. One of them is God. God and up, uh, finger pointed up, and hand turned over. Why would you turn the hand over? Who is always watching us? God. The hand is turned over. Okay? Got it? God. Okay? One more. God loves. Okay? God, can you do it with me? Come on. God loves. Now then, who does God love? God loves me, God loves you, God loves, who else? He loves you too. God, let's say it, God. By the way, we bring it down. You know why we bring it down? Because God came down to earth. Uh -huh. God looking. Come down. God loves you. God loves you. And God loves me. Now, I'll say it, and you repeat it after me and pray, okay? Oh God, we love you and thank you that you love us. You are our shepherd who always looks after us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before you go back and join your family or friends, I have a treat for y'all with you. When I talked, or when I was a substitute teacher, I gave them what I call smart pills. You know them as smarties. You know them as smarties. Now, do one more thing. On your way back, pick out someone you don't know. And say, what do we say? God loves you. Okay? I love you. Thank you for coming. And tell someone God loves them on the way back. Oh, I thought you wanted some smarties. Did these really make you smart? The kids used to think they did. 
I may have to give it a shot. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's, uh, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we uh, are grateful for that abiding care over us as our good shepherd. We thank you that you love us. Uh, we have that great assurance from your word. <clears throat> and that um, you are there uh, to care for the sheep. We thank you for Jesus, the good shepherd, who laid down his life for the sheep. And he laid it down only to take it up again. Um, we would pray that we find strength and comfort in that. And we would always look to him and would hear his voice and follow his voice as he uh, leads us. By the word and by the spirit. We, um, we pray for your uh, direction and your wisdom and your abiding care uh, over us in this place. Um, each, uh, even in a small church like this, each of us has a number of burdens and cares, and uh, we need you. We need you desperately to be involved in our lives individually and together. We would pray that your glory would shine forth even in this place, that we um, would be we would exemplify um, the, the marvel and the wonder of um, that teaching of Jesus that said that the, that the kingdom is like a mustard seed. Um, though it is the smallest of seeds, it um, takes root and grows and provides a habitation for the birds. It seems small and insignificant, and yet it has its tremendous impact. what it's supposed to do. We would pray that that be the case. Uh, we, uh, that our uh, teaching and our ministry and our support and encouragement of one another in the fellowship would be a tremendous impact in, in our lives um, with one another as well as those we have contact with. Um, that there would be gospel impact um, wherever we go, whatever we do. Um, not only while we're together, but when we depart and we go our separate ways when we're in the workplace and when we are at leisure, when we're interacting with neighbors or associates, that um, Christ in us would have um, an influence uh, in the lives of others. And lead us in that. Teach us how we may um, shed the light of the gospel of Christ in this community and in the places in which we work and live and, and where we go. Um, we would pray for the effectiveness of the ministry of the church, uh, all of your churches, everywhere across this globe, um, that everywhere there would be uh, an effective uh, gospel ministry, that the, the rule and the reign of God in Jesus Christ would be proclaimed and there would be um, evident um, responsiveness to that. Um, we pray and, and ask you to move powerfully in this land, in our community, in this state, in this country, in a great revival. Uh, we long to see that in our day where there would be widespread effect of changed hearts, of regeneration in the hearts of men and women. And we would, we would long for the day in which we would see the tremendous impact and blessing that that would have in our society. Um, so, Lord, move, move in dramatic ways. We would ask that you help us direct us to know how we are to um, be agents of your compassion and your grace in the lives of others, that we would exemplify and also speak the words of the gospel to those who need it. Um, direct us in that and, um, and put us in the right places. Help us to have our eyes open and ready. Um, as your word says, always be prepared to give um, an answer, to give a defense to give an explanation for the hope that is in us and to do so with gentleness and with love, to, to reflect it, to um, display it properly to others. Uh, guard us and guard your gospel ministers, teachers, and preachers from presenting the goodness of the gospel in a manner that makes it seem repulsive and mean and ugly. Help us to find the proper balance of standing firm, firm in truth and yet speaking the good news of the gospel 
in love. Love for God. Love for our neighbors. Help us to share it day by day. To love our neighbors, those closest to us, those around us. So that they may see, they may see the light of the gospel, the fruit of our faith, the good deeds, the goodness of our actions, the savoriness of our words, and they will give glory to our Father. They will realize something good is at work in us. Make that real for every one of your people. And so direct a massive missionary force on and into this community and around the world. We love you. We pray for those who are sick, those who are ailing, and especially those going through chronic treatments and uh, chronic um, illness, that you would grant your grace and healing to them, support those who are helping them and caring for them, and uh, carry them on by your grace, that we would all recognize your good hand in those situations. We give praise to you for the ways that you have brought us through, directed us, and uh, heal us and care for us as your people. And we would give you praise and give you all glory. We thank you for hearing us and we pray your care uh, over us and that you would, in fact, be at work sanctifying us by your grace for your glory. For we lift all these things up, thanking you and praising you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as the usher now come as we worship the, the giving of our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
I think it's about two words in Hebrew. It's that direct. Um, what, I've, what I have done um, is to actually read the second table of law, those that pertain to our fellow human beings, our neighbors. First table of are those four that uh, direct us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? And the next six, the second table, are those to love our neighbors as ourselves. That was the great commandment. Two aspects of the great commandment when Jesus was asked, by the way. It wasn't two great commandments, not two separately. They actually go together to love God and to love neighbor. Two aspects of the great commandment. And so uh, let me read that, 16 through, um, well, I think I say through 22 there. Um, 21 gets us through the commandments. Uh, so give attention. This is the word of the Lord. This is the law of God. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long, that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire in your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly. They are the mountain from out of the fire, and the cloud of the deep darkness. And he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. This is the reading of God's holy word. He wrote them on stone tablets because they were to have an ongoing and everlasting significance and application. Please be aware that the moral law that is um, summarized in the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> yes, summarized, um, they are principial, they target certain areas of life, and yet <clears throat> when we understand them in their completeness, they're not only, they're not restricted in certain areas, they actually span uh, to, a, to many things that are relative to that particular, that particular command or that area of life. The, uh, I have printed there uh, in underneath our order of service in the bulletin that, that modernized the section there of, of something about the relevance um, of the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Um, that's why I'm preaching it. If, if, we, if it was done for and we no longer had to pay attention to it, we would, we would move on. But God put it on some paddles to study it. We're going about this in the manner of trying to not only understand the commandments in and of themselves, but also to know and to love God through the commandment. To know and love God through the commandments of these ten words. Today, we get to the one, chapter, um, or verse 17, you shall not murder, was the translation that I read. Many of you have probably um, if you memorize the Ten Commandments at some point, you remember the old traditional rendering, Thou shalt not kill. Now, why in the world would modern translations change that? Well, it's because um, the uh, particular concern of the commandment and the word that is used is not killing in general. There are actually, there are actually aspects that when um, it takes place, it's not considered a violation of um, uh, of, of this law. However, that's not to say that it's very restrictive. It's actually, it actually incorporates pretty much anything that we would consider to be deliberate, intentional, premeditated, as well as unintentional and neglectful actions or, you know, something. And then, of course, we go to the New Testament and find out that Jesus had, he applied the law not only in our actions, but also in the intentions and the motives of our heart. So to understand this properly and to understand God and love God through this commandment, we have to understand it that way. I put in there also at the bottom of the order of service the shorter catechism question or the answer. 
<clears throat> about this. And as I, I mentioned before, the Westminster Catechism um, follows the pattern that came out of Reformation teaching in which the commandments, if they're written in a negative form, thou shalt not form, then there's a corresponding positive requirement that is also to be part of it. To, be, to understand it properly, you, you get that. Now, if it's written in a positive, you know, honor your father and mother, there's also corresponding prohibitions or, or restrictions. Let me read to you, let me quickly read a modernized version of the larger catechism. Okay? When you look at that question there printed, it says, what does the Sixth Commandment require? Okay, and it says something like this. It requires lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and the life of others. The Sixth Commandment forbids the taking away of our own life and the life of a neighbor unjustly. Or, here's this phrase, I love this phrase. Whatsoever tendeth thereunto. Whatsoever tendeth thereunto. Whatever it tends toward. Not just the actions or the things that affect it, but whatever tends toward that. Whatever is in the movement toward those things. Here's how. Okay, it's going to take a second to read this. Larger Catechism says, what does the Sixth Commandment require? The Sixth Commandment requires us to do our best to make every lawful effort to preserve our own life and the lives of others. We do this by not thinking about or planning or by, by controlling our emotions, by avoiding all opportunities, temptations, or actions that would promote or lead to the unjust taking of someone's life. In the pursuit of that goal, we must defend others from violence, Patiently endure the afflictions from God's hand, have a quiet mind and a cheerful spirit, practice temperance in the way we eat, drink, and take medications, sleep, work, and play. We should also harbor charitable thoughts, love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, and kindness. Our speech and behavior should be peaceful, mild, and courteous. We should be tolerant of others, be ready to be reconciled, patiently put up with and forgive injuries against us and return good for evil. Finally, we should provide aid and comfort to those in distress as well as protect and defend the innocent. Whatsoever tendeth thereunto is actually pretty extensive when you look through all of the scriptures to see the ways in which this is taught. That's what I'm saying. You really want us, you really want to learn? But you also really want to be convicted to study the larger catechism because it's extremely thorough. It looks to every place in Scripture to try to shed light on the commandments. Yeah. We should not think about this commandment, and the first thing is only consider those who have, or who would, or who could, or is most likely to actually carry out an act of homicide. That's very much included. It's very much there. It's pretty clear. It's like, okay, that's so obvious that, that that's actually not where we need to spend our, spend our time. Our concern ought to be to see the depth and the breadth of this commandment as it relates to every person, to everyone, in every way in which we have violated this commandment. Always keeping in mind this is not as, as um, difficult as it is in our human relations with one another. This is not a command that is unpardonable. Okay? In fact, it is in the pardoning of this very serious sin in human society by God for those who repent and look to Him and have found the grace that Christ offers. It is the place where it can be most evidently viewed for what it is. And grace is really grace when it comes to this commandment. But it's not for a few. It's for all of us. Even if you can, have you ever heard somebody say that? Well, I mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I've never killed anybody. Almost as if that's, oh, okay. Let's put a badge on you. Let's put a blue ribbon. Yeah, that's okay. But have you gossiped? 
Have you slandered people behind their back? Have you been so mad at somebody that honestly, if they died on the spot, it really wouldn't matter to you? Are there people right now, public figures, who you know that, that you would go, I, I don't even care about that person at all. All of that is taught in Scripture as contrary to the hearts that God wants of us. What the commandment speaks to. That's what this is speaking about. By the way, uh, well, I need to get into it and, and show you a little more. The uh, three of our biblical heroes would very easily be condemned by this commandment in some of its most significant forms. How many of you have Moses as a hero? One of my heroes. Remember what he did when he saw that Egyptian being harsh with his fellow Hebrew? He struck him down to death. I like Moses as a hero, but probably one of the ones I remember as a kid was David. Who has David as your hero? I do. I especially like the story. I think because I was always so, so timid, I always loved. I always love the story of David standing in the face of Goliath and bringing down the giant. But you remember what David did, don't you? He saw Bathsheba and he began to desire her. And that that grew, that covetousness grew, okay, to a place where he took he, he you know he pulled out all the stops. Tries to bring her husband from the battlefield to, after he's committed the act, to try to cover it by bringing the husband in so that maybe he would go, go with her. And then when he refused because this good soul, he's like, you know, how can I take advantage of this privilege when none of my other fellow soldiers are getting this? He refused. Um, and then David has him sent to the front line where the fiercest of the battle in order to have him put to death. It's very powerful when Nathan comes to him and tells him a little parable to act like he's talking about some people in the community, in the nation. There was a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had all these animals at his disposal. The poor man had one little ewe lamb that he loved like a daughter. It was like, it was like a family pet, not just a livestock. And he says when the, the rich man has a visitor come, he goes and he takes that guy's ewe lamb away and he slaughters it to, to host his and David says, that infuriates me. That man deserves nothing but death. There should not be that way. I want to know who it is. And Nathan says, you are the man. I've heard people try to justify and act like he, as king, he could have done this. And if it wasn't, uh, if Nathan didn't say think so, God told Nathan to go tell David he had killed the Ulam. Of Uriah, or he, he killed Uriah, I guess is what, what really the, the details of it is. He was the one who killed. He was the one who violated this. And then David was pierced to the heart and he recognized that he had violated it. And it reads Psalm 51. You think David didn't believe he had sinned greatly? Just read his prayer. His confession of sin and his pleading for the joy of God's salvation return. It's pardonable, though. It's awful. It's, it's horrendous. And then the other hero of the New Testament is Paul. Paul wasn't actively involved in the stoning of Stephen, but we're told very clearly he was there giving his approval. And he was going around uh, throwing Christians in jail and, and uttering murderous threats. Threatening people, using that kind of thing before the Lord confronted him changed. It's a pardonable sin, okay? Now, let's get to know it more. Let's apply it to ourselves. That's what, that's what I want to get at here. And then, obviously, finish with, let's, how do we love God through it? First of all, notice this. Notice that um, it's actually murder comes on the scene very rapidly after the fall, after the sin of Adam and Eve. Okay? Genesis 3 is the sin. 
Then there's the handing down of the sentence and the curse, the proclamation of that to all of the parties that God gives. Chapter 4. Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. And you don't even get to verse 7 or 8 before a murder has been committed out of jealousy, out of envy. Cain and Abel, they brought their sacrifices. I think the key to understanding what was going on with them was that Abel, it says, he brought the fat portion. So, so you know, you may have heard it said, oh, he was bringing animal sacrifice and, and Cain was bringing, you know, the, the fruits of the field and that wasn't right. Because later we find out that God's sacrificial system was the shedding of blood and such. And however, at this point, that wasn't made very clear. I think the key to it is to understand that, that, that um, Abel brought the fat, he brought the best portions and he gave it to the Lord. He, he, he selected that which was good. And he offered it to God in a sense of showing his true trust and commitment and his worship of God by bringing the best. A a Cain brought some of the fruits of the earth. It's as if he probably looked through his, oh, well, you know, I, I don't want to get rid of these. These are some of the best. But you know, these over here, I'll take some of them. There was a whole different heart attitude in which he was given. And then what was offered was a reflection of the heart attitude. But because God honored Abel and Cain's was not, Cain became envious and jealous and hatred grew. And God even confronts him before I mean, so, you know, what, what's wrong with you? You need to guard yourself. Sin is crouching at the door. He gives him a warning. And yet Cain, in his envy, he goes and he takes his brother out privately and strikes him down. He murders him out of a cold heart. God confronts us. Hey, where's your brother? You know the famous one. Well, I my brother's keeper. And you know the answer to that, baby. You know what? You know what Deuteronomy uh, five seventeen says, don't you? As it relates to that question, you, you know what? All of these texts. If I ought to make you, I ought, to, I ought to send you all these Bible texts that support that long catechism question and make you look them up and give you a quiz on it. No, no, I'll give you a quiz. But anyway, um, the, you know, what throughout the scriptures, you know what the answer to that is? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are your brother's keeper. You are. You are to be about the business of making sure your brother, by blood, your brother by faith, your brother by being a person in the image of God. When Jesus says love your, it's love your neighbor, which means, you know, your brother is anyone who's near you. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. Whatsoever tendeth thereunto of keeping your brother and preserving his life is important for you. It is significant. And, uh, and that's, it, it shows up on the scene very quickly. Soon after the fall of mankind into this, an estate of sin and misery, Cain commits murder against his brother. Um, the, the, the actual word, there are various words in Hebrew. I know there's, there's various ones. And often the use of various words will, will distinguish, although it's, it's not to be hard and fast. A lot of the language can sometimes be flexible. But there's a, there's a particular word. It's a word that's fun to say. I remember learning Hebrew. It's very... It's very uh, satisfying learning Hebrew because it's so different. Uh, but this this word is ratzach. Okay, you get the you know there should be saliva coming out when you do the last you know sound ratzach. And uh, this this word is um, and, and the reason why the modern translations have moved to the word murder. Okay, and, and, and there's there's a good thing about that, and then there's there's a limit to it. The move word murder is that rock There are certain types of um, actions that would lead to death that are not considered to be a violation of rock okay, or the command. But what are those? Okay, you're like, what? what are you talking about? Are there ways? Okay. Well, let's say your government says all you 
go win. You're going to, you're going to be soldiers. You're going to go to war because we have declared war against one of our enemies. We're sending you off to war. And you're going to take up arms and you're going to fight for us. And you, know, you know what's going to happen if you don't go? We're going to either throw you in jail or, you know, something. They're, you know, you're the, the, um, the government, the proper authority has declared war and they send their people off to war. In the context of war, um, fighting in normal combat, combat is not considered to be a, a, you know, a violation of this. Right? Now, there may be many crimes and sins to be answered for in the context of war. It's a mess. There's all sorts of things. <clears throat> also, just because somebody has a uniform on, has been issued doesn't mean that they're free to all kinds of killing. Obviously, we hear of, of instant instances where a soldier may cross the line and commit an act of homicide in a situation that you know doesn't call for that. An unarmed person, a civilian, you know, I mean, all sorts of things. That that would be ratzak. That would be a murderous act. But warfare. What else? Uh, the actions of a, of a, a proper uh, a government that has instituted a law and carries out the consequence of that law, in particular if it is a capital punishment because of the violation of, you know, the capital crime of taking someone's life, premeditated way or you know, whatever the thing is. So that's not considered to be a violation. In Genesis 9-6, uh, you know, the, the, the covenant that um, God established with um, Noah before the whole uh, you know rainbow, the, the bow in the sky being the sign of a covenant that says God will never again <clears throat> destroy the earth with the flood. He says this, and for your lifeblood, he, he opens up the possibility. He says now you can have even the animals to eat. You know previously I've given you the green plants, now you have the animals. But in the after saying that, so that but for your lifeblood, I will require reckoning. From every beast I'll require it from man, from his fellow man, I'll require reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man his image. You see there, God declaring a, a, a concern <clears throat> about how someone, if they took the life blood, they, they killed another human being. Now, why is that so significant? <clears throat> and you see here where it's tied directly to that notion in creation that Mankind, humankind, male and female, of uh, those are said to be made in the image of God. <clears throat> Sorry. So the, you see, the, the act of homicide is not just an act of homicide. It's not just an act against a human being. It is against God because that person has the image of God. They, they carry that. <laughs> That's why it's significant. That's why it can be a legitimate form of punishment. Not necessarily that it has to be, but it but but it certainly is something God is concerned about. In his Old Testament law, he he issued um, commands that would end with um, with with death if that was the Violation. It was life for life. If, if this was a, if this was a life, then it, you know, that's what would result. So Rotsak is limited by government actions, and of course the other one might be you, we would consider it to be self defense. Okay. I remember a story of a neighbor of mine. I heard about it, in which someone was had, had told them, "I'm coming." That you know they were so angry. There was such a few that they were coming. And the guy was going to get his gun to come to his workplace of work to kill him. And the other, what he didn't know was this guy had his own gun. And instead of letting the guy come and kill him, he used his gun to kill the guy who was going to kill him. Self-defense. And there are ways in which the Old Testament law demonstrates if somebody is unintentional, they were defending their own lives, or someone else, then that's not considered rock solid. So there are limitations. However, make sure you understand that this is not only to be viewed. Here's where the word murder convinces. Because we hear the word murder, we probably only think in terms of what? First degree premeditated murder. Actually, it, it, it 
obviously includes that, but it's also inclusive of other things that are not that are not um, that are not what we consider to be premeditated. There are still when someone is significantly negligent and um, and, and, and put up uh, you know uh, or if their recklessness and carelessness puts people at harm, then that's still a violation of rights. Okay, I didn't intend to lose my temper and start a fight and end up, you know, that people were killed. It doesn't matter you intended it, it's still your recklessness and your, your lack of control that ends that way. You know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, my, uh, my ox, okay, by the way, Exodus 21, you read about this. I, you know, I, I realized it had, you know, chased down a few people. It, it was trying to gore some of my neighbors, but I didn't think much about it. I still let it run loose. I didn't really think and intend for, you know, Sam over here to get gored to death. But there was consequences very significantly. If they knew that that was a real danger, they were supposed to do something about it. They were supposed to restrain the sound. So it's not premeditated murder only. It was, there was consequences, and that was very significant. The ox was to be killed, and the part and the owner was, if they were that thing. They knew this was a problem, but they didn't do anything about it. There was also, you know, the concerns. Um, it, it sounds a little odd today, but, I mean, it wouldn't sound odd if I said, hey, now make sure if you're building a new place and you've got a second story, make sure there's a good railing there so that people won't stumble and fall off the second floor, okay? In, in Deuteronomy 22, you read where the law says, if you build a house, make sure you put a parapet, you know, kind of a railing around this, the roof. They would go to work to cool off, to do various things, to make sure. Or if I said, hey, if you're building that pool, make sure you get you have a good fencing to make sure somebody doesn't accidentally, you know, go through there. Who knows? Maybe the neighbor's kids at night will be out doing something, you know, and they may not realize there's a pool there. And who knows? They may not be able to swim or they may not be able to help one of them. You know, there's a concern about that. And those um, actions were just as important to fulfill this as any. Now, if we're, to, if we're to love God through the commandment, uh, we've got to switch gears here. Uh, understand that uh, when Jesus comes along in Matthew 5 and he's teaching, he says, you know, you heard it said, Matthew 5, 21, 22, you heard it said, it was said of all, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Okay? He's taking it now to the heart, no matter the heart. Um, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. It's similar to this. Later on, Matthew 15, you would read this. When he's teaching them about what makes someone unclean or sinful. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person, okay? It's not the things out there that you come in contact with that defile you. The heart is unclean. The heart is sinful. The heart it's, it's already, oh, it's, that is what comes out. What are those? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat, what, to eat with unwashed hands is not defiling anyone. See what he's done there? To Jesus, to understand the commandment properly. This, he's not adding to it. He's not taking it where it didn't belong. He's just bringing out the full implication of it. We, we don't need to just check that one off casually. Like, oh, I don't have to worry about that one. I've really never been in that position where I need to, you know, act in such ways or whatever. No, nope. from the heart comes anger, insult, to cast someone off of the attitude that they're, they're of no moral good or significance. I mean, when we were at Christ Covenant Church up in Ferry, um, we met in the school, we had a small group meeting, and the very night when we were studying the Sermon on the Mount, and we talked about this very thing, we were driving home, about to turn off Kingston Pike and go the back way through the roads to get there home in, in Little City, Loudoun County. And as I'm about to get into the left-hand turn lane, somebody from way back there had to swing over into the, you know, the double turn lane and wheel past me just as I'm about to go in. Now, look at that idiot. Sorry, I hate to say that, but that's exactly what I said. 
And in some of the translations it says that insult is raka. I remember, you know what I mean? Idiot. Something of that nature. You want to you wanna know the Lord didn't drive home to me the reality? What seemed like something I didn't really need to worry too much about, this commandment of murder and murder of the heart. I didn't even get home until I had so vividly, so obviously, and so easily moved into the area of that. Now that, again, obviously, if you compare the two, if I ran him down and run him off the road, I'm assuming it was a um, run him off the road and did harm to him, that's worse than me losing my temper in my car, getting upset, and moving on with life. However, it doesn't change the fact that my heart is ready. It's ready at any moment to cast off somebody. 1 John 3. This is the message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brother, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. See that? Not just Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. John took it before he realized. Hate in the heart is murder in the heart. You know no murder has eternal life abiding in him. So how do we love God through that? I'm going to give you two reasons. One is to realize that this commandment is showing us the very heart of God toward his creatures in his image. The fact that there's a commandment that directly addresses this is showing that, you know, God, uh, Ron is telling you, again, God loves you. God loves you. All persons walking on this earth are in the image of God. And therefore, the commandment would restrain and encourage a respect at that level and, and, and an admiration of every human being, to be, uh, you know, as image bearers of God. And he's codified and he's put it into this significant, um, very direct law to make sure it's always with the Lord. We can love God through to see that he, as the Lord of life, the Lord over all those living, has made clear his concern for human beings. Whether those human beings are believers or unbelievers is not of, of, of consequence. They are in the image of God. Do they share our biblical conviction? That doesn't matter. They are in the image of God. They may not understand it. They might not grasp what we understand. They might even share our view of it. It doesn't matter. They're in the image of God. And we must, we must apply this significantly. Now, the other thing is this. When you read those New Testament texts, you have to understand this law condemns every one of us. This isn't only for a few. This isn't only relevant up at Morgan County or Bledsoe or wherever else. This is, that, that command isn't relevant only in those places. This is a commandment that every single person, here's how you're going to love God in it. Do you realize it's not only Moses and David and Paul who had to be forgiven and pardoned by God for this kind of thing, but every single Christian believer who's living now, whoever lived, has to be pardoned of the sin. I know you've never taken the action, but when you take Jesus' word serious and you read 1 John 3, you realize, wait a minute, this is much more than the act of homicide. Hatred in the heart, a disregard for another human being to the degree that you honestly don't care whether they live or die. That is whatsoever tendeth thereunto. That is what is leading toward. It is one of the steps along the movement toward actual action of homicide and murder. And for us to get comfortable with that is, is that God doesn't want it. He wants us to recognize it, to pray about it, confess, but his pardon of you includes that. He pardoned you of your violation of the sixth commandment. Christ died. Isn't it ironic? Really, the most unjust death ever committed in order to bring 
righteousness to those who have in many various degrees violated the commandments not soccer murderous hearts murderous actions whatever and that's, that, isn't that really where love is known? It's when you're loved through and beyond the offense and the offenses. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And one of the ways we were sinners is we have violated the sixth commandment. God is known in the Sixth Commandment by showing and revealing the value and the importance of every human being. There's some important implications of that. Um, and He is showing that we may love Him because He loves us in spite of our violating that command. Let us love the Lord with all our heart. Let us follow David's example and give ourselves an hour to him, recognizing that we have violated this and that in Christ we've been pardoned. And we have the hope of this continued blessing because of this grace that is known to us in Christ. Amen. 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 644, may the mind of Christ my Savior, we're going to pray that that will guard us, our minds and hearts. 644, Lord. How about we do the first and last verse? for you. We'll stand together.